In this study, we will see how John was carried forward in time to the future without a flux capacitor, without a hot tub time machine, without any crystals or anything Hollywood uses to copy the Bible. They love to copy the Bible and don't have an original thought. They just have to take plots from the greatest book in existence, which is the King James Bible. But John is in exile for preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a street preaching Bible thumper. He was in the aisle that is called Patmos because he had guts to stand up for Jesus Christ. And his faith, just like the martyrs did in Revelation 6-9. Okay, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9 it says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the aisle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The meaning for testimony of Jesus Christ is found in Revelation 19.10 and it says it is the spirit of prophecy. John could tell you the future and in this chapter you will see he has carried forward in time to what is called the day of the Lord. Revelation 1 and verse 10 I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Many will say that the Lord's Day means Sunday, but there isn't any reference in the Bible to the Lord's Day being Sunday. If you have eSword or Sword Searcher, or even do a Google search of Day of the Lord, make sure you are using a King James Bible and read all the verses with the phrase Day of the Lord. You will see it isn't just referring to a single day, but a time spanning to at least a thousand years. As you will see reading the book of Revelation, John sees the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the events of the time of Jacob's trouble, the second coming, and the millennial reign, and so on. And Zephaniah 1.7 says, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests. As you can see by reading verses like this, the Lord's Day isn't Sunday, it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Obviously, John isn't in any type of machine or a DeLorean or a hot tub or a phone booth. God can place a man in any time period, any time he wants to. It's kind of like when you're watching a movie and since you have a remote, you can pause it, rewind it, fast forward, or even go to scene selection. God is in eternity and has already seen the past, present, and future. If God wants to put John sometime beyond 2017, then that is his choice, and anyone can deny that at their own risk of being a Bible rejecter. Also, the phrase, in the Spirit, is taken to mean he was full of the Holy Spirit by many, or something along those lines, but this seems to be a stretch because John was a born-again believer. He was in the Spirit, and the Spirit was in him every day for 24 hours a day. And if you search the word in the spirit, it takes you to places like this in Ezekiel 37, 1, which says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Then when you see how John uses the same phrase in the spirit in Revelation 17, 3, which says he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And then again in Revelation 21.10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now we can get what John is saying to us. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, so he was carried forward in time and seized the day of the Lord which is not just a single day, but a spanning across a thousand years, at least. And we're going to look at some of the things John sees and hears when he steps out of God's time machine. First thing he hears is a great voice as of a trumpet. Psalms 47, 5 says, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. John says something similar to this in Revelation 4.1 when he says, And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. We get our glorified bodies at the last trump, 
as it says in 1 Corinthians 15.52, the last trump referring to the last sound made by a trumpet. In the case of the rapture, it seems it is the voice of God sounding like a trumpet and saying, Come up hither. God's voice is associated with a trumpet many times in the Bible. And then Revelation 111 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Notice the verse said, What thou seest, right in the book. In the Old Testament, John would have been called a seer. And you can read 1 Samuel 9.9, 9, and it gives you the, the description of that. And Satan counterfeits this by fortune tellers, psychics, and so on. I have heard of policemen in Salem, Massachusetts going to witches or psychics to get information on murders. So those are the devil's counterfeit for seers or prophets. But there is no such thing as a good psychic or good witch. Most people who claim to be psychics are lying anyways. When I was really young, I prank called psychics and they couldn't even tell I hadn't even hit puberty yet. But John would be called a seer if this were the Old Testament. The word for seer is prophet. That's what they refer to it as now. And if you look at 1 Samuel 9 and verse 9. It says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God... Thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer, for he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So John would have been called a seer in the Old Testament. So John has the spirit of prophecy and sees these seven churches, which are Ephesus, which means fully purposed, Smyrna, which means myrrh, Pergamos, which means much marriage. Thyatira means odor of affliction. Sardis means red ones. And Philadelphia means brotherly love. And Laodicea means civil rights. And then Revelation 1.12 And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. This would be kind of like a scene from a movie where someone is afraid to look behind them. But when John turned around, he saw seven golden candlesticks. The Bible interprets itself, and you will see that seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches, as it says in Revelation 1.20. So when John is carried forward in time, he doesn't just hear the voice of the Savior, he sees the Savior. Revelation 1.13 says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. John says he sees one likened to the Son of Man. Son of Man is the Jewish designation of the Son of God. So John sees a righteous judge standing right in front of him. How we look at Jesus Christ will affect our attitude towards sin, and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If we see Jesus Christ as J.C. off the Hollywood movies, then we will be carnal Christians. If we see him as a righteous judge, as John saw him, then we will be ready at the judgment seat of Christ and not receive wood, hay, and stubble. And now look at Revelation 1.13. It says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Gird about means clothed about, and paps means breasts. And this gird, golden girdle is a manly man's girdle. It isn't like what you think of today when you say girdle. Just like John the Baptist wore a leather girdle. These men aren't sissies, and they follow Deuteronomy 22.5. And let's see more about how John describes Jesus Christ in his glorified body. Revelation 1.14 says, His head and his hairs were white like wool. As white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire. The thing about Revelation is that it shows the other side of Jesus Christ. It shows the side of Jesus Christ who is ready for vengeance and flaming fire. Don't get me wrong, Jesus Christ was a rough character when he came the first time. But now you see him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
Notice it says his hairs were white like wool. Song of Solomon 5.11 describes Jesus Christ when he came the first time. And it says his head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. But now his hairs are white like wool. Now John is seeing the ancient of days. A lot of movies try to copy this by putting some cool old guy with white hair as some wise and mysterious character. Also notice it says his eyes were as a flame of fire. You see Satan copycats this with his little superhero movies for the kids. With characters like Human Torch and Superman with the beam coming out of his eyes. But Jesus Christ is the one with eyes like a flame of fire. When he came the first time though, he had dove's eyes. As it says in Song of Solomon 115, Behold, thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. And Revelation 115 says, And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice, as the sound of many waters. Are you beginning to realize something strange? Jesus has hair that is white like wool, and feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. And Santa Claus has hair that is white as snow, and he comes down a chimney. And John 10.1 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Not to mention Satan Claus stole the phrase ho ho from Zechariah 2.6 which says ho ho come forth and flee from the land of the north the land of the north and where does Satan live the north pole God is also said to be in the north in Psalms 48.2 and what is Jesus Christ said to do when he was here he was a carpenter Santa is a carpenter Santa makes a list and checks it twice Jesus Christ has a list and knows every sin you have ever committed he knows when you are sleeping and knows when you're awake christians are looking forward to jesus christ coming back while little kids are looking forward to santa claus coming back next year santa comes in a red suit while jesus comes back with garments dyed red isaiah 63 1 says who is this that cometh from edom with dyed garments from basra santa has a bunch of elves jesus has a bunch of angels Santa comes to bring you a gift while Jesus Christ offers you the free gift, and he literally died to be able to give it to you. The thing is, Santa gives you a gift if you're a good little boy or a good little girl, while Jesus Christ is only giving it to those who are wicked as hell, and that's everybody. You say, well, what do you mean wicked? You can't get the gift unless you're a sinner. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. If you're not ungodly, then Jesus Christ didn't die for you. Santa Claus flies with reindeer. God is said to ride on a cherub. Psalm 68, 33, To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. Here's one you probably never heard. I just thought about this while studying this. Santa endorses a drink, Coca-Cola, while Jesus tells you to take the water of life freely. But Coke kills and water gives you life. And the water of life, Jesus Christ, is what saves you. Now you have all of these horror movies coming out with Santa Claus killing everybody. Movies like Santa's Slay, with Slay spelled like S-L-A-Y. This is another mockery from Satan because Jesus Christ is coming back to slay the Antichrist and all the God-haters at the second advent. Every year right after Thanksgiving and right before Christmas... Kids jump in Santa's lap and request thanks for Christmas, while Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. When I was little, I'd hear grown-ups say, Santa and Jesus work together. Back then I thought it was crazy, but now I believe it. You know why? Because God and Satan work so close together that sometimes you can't even tell them apart. In Ezekiel 14, 9, God talks about how he deceives prophets. In 1 Kings 22, 22 through 23, God sends a lying spirit to the mouth of the prophets. God and Satan both tell David to number Israel. If a person wants to disobey God and reject truth, then he will turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And Psalms 125, 3 says, For the rod of the wicked 
shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands into it unto iniquity. God uses Satan and wicked men as a rod to those who disobey. God could use Santa as a rod to those who love this present evil world. You know what they tell you about Santa? You got to believe in him. You have to believe he is real. If you don't believe he is real, then you won't get any presents. What are you supposed to do with Jesus Christ? You're supposed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you get if you're not a good little boy or girl? You get a lump of coal in your stocking. At the judgment seat of Christ, if you lacked in your Christian service, you don't get any gold, you get wood, hay, and stubble. And parents are really dumb. They will tell their kids you better be good if you want Santa to bring you a present. How about telling them they should be good and do right because they need to act like a Christian? But Re uh, Revelation 1.15 says, And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Notice his voice is as the sound of many waters. Psalms 29.3 says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God, God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Psalms 93.4, The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Ezekiel 43.2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Revelation 14.2, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. While this may be frightening at first, it is also comforting. If you have a sound machine, one of the options may be water falling, something like Niagara Falls, which is the sound of many waters, and it helps you sleep. If you're saved, then you don't have to worry about falling into the hands of the living God. You're already a part of His hand, and His voice is a comfort. You'll know His voice because when He calls you by name, you know His voice. You're not afraid. While his voice may be as the sound of many waters. He can comfort you to sleep. A man with a clear conscience before God could sleep through a hurricane. But for someone who's not saved and they heard this voice that sounds like many waters, it would be frightening. But what else did John see when he was carried forward in time? In Revelation 1.16 it says, And when he had... In his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. If you read Revelation 1.20, the Bible interprets itself once more and tells you the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So John sees angels. Many will say that the angels are the pastors of the churches, but where do you find this in the scripture? I take it to be literal angels. This also lets us know that stars can refer to angels in the Bible. The star of Bethlehem was actually an angel. And God telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. I believe this would also refer to angels as well as literal stars. Every angel has a name, and one day we will get to meet them and know their names as well. Revelation 1.16, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This sharp two-edged sword would be the words of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Psalms 149.6 Let the praise, high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Revelation 1.16 And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword in his countenance, was as the sun shineth in his strength. Jesus is referred to as the Son of Righteousness. Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Check out James 1.11, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. I believe that this is referring to Jesus Christ coming back at the second advent in flaming fire. The rich man fades away in his ways because the rich man in the time of Jacob's trouble are the ones who took the mark of the beast. 
But what else does John do when he is carried forward in time? In Revelation 1.17 it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I doubt he fell backwards like he was at a Benny Hinn meeting. He fell flat on his face at his feet. Jesus Christ is the only one worthy to get his foot kissed. Not the Pope. Not the young Pope on HBO or Showtime or Sent to the Max or whatever that show comes on. Notice how precise the King James Bible is. It says he laid his right hand upon me. It didn't say just his hand or his left hand, but his right hand. John was scared when he saw Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus says, Fear not. Many say that at the judgment they will curse God or that they aren't afraid of him. But even John who walked and talked with Jesus Christ was afraid when he saw him in Revelation 1.17. Once Revelation 1 17 and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me fear not I am the first and the last Jesus Christ is the first and the last he was here before and during the creation you can see the Godhead in Genesis 1 1 through 3 it says in the beginning God that's God the Father created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God, there's the Holy Ghost, moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, There's the word, Jesus Christ, let there be light, and there was light. So you see the Godhead in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, Jesus Christ has always been here. He was here before the beginning, and he'll be here for eternity. Next we see that John also sees the keys of hell and of death. In Revelation 1, 18, it says, I am he that liveth, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ came down to earth as a man, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, so he was living and was dead. Then he rose from the dead the third day. Now he is alive forevermore. During this process, he took the keys of hell and of death. The Bible talks about other sets of keys, like the keys to the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 16, 19, the keys of the house of David in Isaiah 22, 22, the key of knowledge in Luke eleven fifty two, and the key of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9. Jesus Christ has the keys of hell and of death. This is because hell has gates and bars, but he conquered death, hell, and the grave. When he was dead for three days and three nights, he was in the heart of the earth in paradise, and in hell he preached to the spirits in prison. Jesus Christ did go to hell, but he didn't burn, as a lot of these guys are teaching now. Revelation 1.19 says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So he writes, The things which thou hast seen, which to John would be Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. The things which are would be Revelation 4. And then from then on would be the future. But for us, Revelation 4.22 is all future. And Revelation 1.20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks to seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So as we talked about before, the seven stars are literal angels of the seven churches and aren't the pastors, they are just angels. The seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So each church has an angel that represents it, just like Michael the archangel represents Israel, there are, re there are representations in heaven of things that are down here. Just like when they thought Peter was dead, they thought they saw his angel. But this has been Revelation 1, 9-20.